welcome to our COIL conversation. My name is Larry Reagan. I'm one of the directors of the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning, uh, especially to welcome our guest from Google, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, before I do that, though, I just want to mention um, this format for our COIL conversation. It's a little bit different than what we've done before in this type of a program. If you've ever joined us before, we're typically one or two of us around a table, audience online. In this case, we, we wanted to try something different, and Kevin and Adam were uh, brave enough to say, yeah, we'll try that. So this is a mix between kind of a Coil Fisher talk and a Coil conversation. I'd also like to make sure I welcome our guest online. Thank you for joining us. And we have our very uh, capable uh, Kyle Peck, uh, another one of our directors from Coil. <laughs> Uh, monitoring and channeling, Kyle. I like to say channeling your your spirits. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so as we have uh, questions and, and uh, responses coming in from that community, I'll ask Kyle, or he'll wave me down, and we'll get questions as well. So uh, thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kevin Freed and Adam Deer. Uh, and we'll, we'll, I told him we'll promise no deer jokes this week here in Pennsylvania. <coughs> so there I did my one deer joke, Thank sorry. You. Thank you. And uh, uh, these gentlemen are really uh, in an interesting position within Google. They have the opportunity to travel around to different institutions learning about what is of interest to higher education and how that intersects with Google services, products, uh, and outcomes. And so they're always looking at that intersection. And uh, over breakfast, Kevin was just sharing sort of a framework that he would like to use to sort of talk us through this. And the interesting thing from, from my perspective is how focused they are around consumer behaviors. We say consumers, we can say students, whatever, but individuals' behaviors using technologies and the resulting expectations of that. And that's what Kevin and Adam are going to share with us a little bit and where, where they see Google sort of addressing <coughs> kind of those needs. So with that, Kevin, welcome to Penn State and we'll turn it over to you. Excellent, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, hello everyone. Thank you for the uh, warm welcome and everyone can hear me okay? Yeah. We're good, everything's working. And thank you, Larry. We have a Larry too oh. <laughs> at Google. Um, he's the, uh, the founder of Google, right? is uh, our Larry, and um, so it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I, um, I do have the pleasure of flying around the country and talking to various presidents of universities, um, people that are in the ed tech space, and beginning to think about how they're uh, preparing for the future of what education is gonna look like and how Google's tools, products, services can fit into that future. Uh, so we thought that's what we'd talk uh, about for a little bit today, um, and we'll go from there. And, I also have some Penn State stories that are just, just awesome. So this isn't my first time here. My brother-in-law went to school at Penn State, so I was here for graduation about six years ago. It was my first time here, and it was absolutely an amazing experience, and he absolutely loved his experience. My other uh, interactions with Penn State is I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of Penn State alum uh, throughout the years. You know people are Penn State alum because the second Penn State comes up in a conversation, whatever business meeting you're in needs to pause. <laughs> for about five minutes while they all reflect on their experiences from Penn State. I've grown accustomed to this over time, so I now, the second Penn State comes up, go, okay, we're just gonna pause to clear if anyone in the room is from Penn State, and then we move on. And, um, and that's worked quite well for us. But uh, so, so again, thank you for having us here. You know, we're into the slides. So what we're really here to talk about today is, you know, how do we create the future for people, and how do we create future uh, astronauts and future scientists and mathematicians. Um, and that really is, at the end of the day, what we're doing in education, right? We're preparing people for a future uh, that they're going to perform in. Now, one of the, the interesting stats here that for me is just kind of mind boggling is that 60%, right? 60% of uh, children who are in grade school right now are going are gonna to be employed in careers that don't exist right now. Right? They're going to be employed in areas that we haven't even thought of uh, where jobs are going to be. And, and how do you prepare for a future that is moving just that fast? Right? And, and then we came across some data from the Economist Group, and they ran some, a study on skills that are needed in the workplace. And one thing for us to consider here is just that problem solving and teamwork, these are going to be the skills and the things that people need to be taught into the future to be able to succeed in a workforce that is changing at such a rapid pace that it's nearly impossible to keep up with. 
And this is one of the things that we think about every day as we begin to think about technology and its impact on how we educate people to do that, right? So when we take a look at where we are right now, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, this is a real picture, <laughs> right? And, and this is, in some instances, what is happening, right? And as you can see, it's an old computer in Tech Corner in some grade school somewhere. Um, and obviously, we, we don't love to see this um, because this is what students are saying right now. And I love this letter, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, it's quite timely because we're heading into the holidays. But as you can see, like, they've even gone as far as they, if they could just make that link clickable, it would have been even easier for Santa, presumably. But the, the stark contrast, right, between kind of where we are and, and where this generation is and, and how they want to be educated is, is just so obvious, and it's right there. And ultimately, you know, this is what we'd love for, for classrooms to look like, right? We'd love them to be an open environment where people can learn technology-enabled. Now, I think it's really important for all of us to consider, though, because especially coming from a company that is interested in devices, that devices don't equal engagement, right? And I think everyone, I'm probably talking to a room of people that are in just violent agreement with me on that, <laughs> but they don't equal engagement. Devices are useful tools that can enable you to open up the learning environment in a more meaningful way. And when we think about education at Google, we do really consider that. So we really break it down into considering it we're thinking about education in, in a few different areas. We think about it in terms of platforms, um, devices, content, and marketing. And, and I'll pause a second on each of those, but I think most people know by now that our, our kind of mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Um, ensuring that teachers and students everywhere have access to that technology is a very natural extension of that. And that is what we think about, is how do we produce technology that enables everyone to do their job in a way where the technology almost fe feels seamless and in the background. And when you look at the platforms that we've created to do that in Classroom, um, in, in some of our cloud uh, applications that you, can, that you can utilize from Google, you know, we've done that. We've made things easier, we've made things quicker um, to enable the learning environment. Devices are also really important, even though I said they don't equal student engagement. Our devices are important though, and I think Google has figured out how to produce a lower cost device, right? That is incredibly personalized to each of the students. So you can go on a device, you can change your profile, and it immediately would switch from me to say Adam or Larry if they were using that device. Those devices are also able to be updated on anywhere from 10 devices to 10,000 devices at the same time. So it's this really kind of scalable platform um, and devices that we've created. And, and then content is an area that we don't always think of Google about or in, but through the use of YouTube and through the use of uh, Google Play, we're beginning to enable different ways that we can uh, give, give uh, educators access to, to various forms of content. So how many people in the room have heard of uh, Google Cardboard? Right, yeah, so majority of the room at this point. How many people have heard of uh, Expeditions? <coughs> yeah, only a couple. So that's. So Expeditions is a great example, and I'll pause here on Expeditions and then we'll move into some other consumer behaviors that are maybe more relevant to higher education. Um, so Expeditions, basically what Expeditions is, is it utilizes Google Cardboard in a form of virtual reality, and it connects anywhere from 20 to 30 headsets together at the same time. Those headsets are all playing the same virtual experience, and a teacher at the front of the classroom has a tablet that controls that virtual experience. So th this was all created in, in a Googler's kind of spare time where they had come to the realization that taking kids on field trips was really expensive but ultimately an amazing experience for them. So how could they bring that in a digital way to the classroom? So for example, a way to think about this is if you wanted to go to the Great Wall of China, a teacher could bring up a virtual representation of the Great Wall of China and every student's headset would be there at the same time. The teacher can press the tablet, it would put an arrow at certain areas and you could see the students kind of move towards that. It's a really cool technology, I would encourage everyone to check it out. I've used it in my daughter's first grade class, so I had the opportunity to go in and do it with her whole school, so outside of being a really cool dad that was able to come in, you know, to the first grade class with, with all this, this high tech stuff, and by the way, not just for the kids, for like the principal and the whole school, because they were like, oh yeah, this is really cool. Um, you know, they, they, you could see the kids kind of light up, and, and I shared this other quick story, which I'll, I'll share again at breakfast, but 
I have, uh, so I have three kids. I talk about them a lot. I'm sure many of the people at work are, are sick of hearing about them. But um, they're, Alexandra's my oldest at six, Emily at four, and Andrew at two. One day, uh, Emily had come home from just her pre-K, and she had decided that she wanted to be an astronaut, right? So this was Emily at four years old going, hey, I want to be an astronaut. So outside of the first reaction was awesome, <laughs> right? How do we make this happen? But then second reaction was like, I'm sure she's going to come home tomorrow and pick a completely different profession. Um, but after she did this, like it kind of occurred to me that I was like, oh, wow, Emily, like I can actually show you what that's like right now, right? Because I work at Google and I have access to this cardboard, which everyone has access to, but it's kind of top of mind. So I took out a cardboard and we put Emily right on Mars. And there's a virtual representation from the Mars rover in a, in a VR environment of what that looks like. And she can physically experience Mars. She can experience a spaceship. And all that sounds really cool, but the aha moment for me on all that was, wow, if this was 20 years ago, Emily would have had this spark. I would have needed to figure out how to go to the library. She would have had to find someone to read it to her because she couldn't read. And she would have had a secondhand experience that looked like text. And now at four years old, not even being able to read, Emily is immersed in what potentially it feels like to be an astronaut. Now, we, we, who knows what the future holds for Emily. I, I hope she lives her dream and goes to space. <laughs> but, but regardless, like, we've created a spark. And the more people that we do that in, the, the more you know, we, we kind of create. And hopefully that gives you a little bit of sense of how we think about our tools before I flip over to just some consumer behaviors and what that potentially means to higher education and, and where we go from here. And also, too, at any point, like I, I know I'm kind of rolling here. If, if anyone has questions or thoughts, stop, and then we're also going to have some time in a little bit, right? Um, OK, so digitization and mobile has changed expectations, and it has dramatically. I, I think one of the, this is probably hard to read for everyone, but one of the things that's kind of another moment of a, a data point for me is that for every one second it takes a mobile page to load, 20% of the people will abandon it. Like, that is how addicted we have become to speed, right, in the mobile environment, and how much we, we kind of crave things to be quick. The other thing is that when we think about digital assistance, you know, 29% of 36 to 55 year olds, so basically what, what this stat is, is I would rather use the phone than interact in a digital environment. At 36 to 55, it's only 29%. At 17 to 35, it's only 12%, right? So it's rare now that we want to pick up the phone. And you see this playing out all around you in banks and anything. I mean, in, even in this room, right, like it's, it's hard to imagine a scenario where you'd rather sit on a phone for 15 minutes to talk to your bank than to go online. In fact, banks have taken this so seriously that now you can take pictures of your checks, right? And you're, you're getting to a point in time where you can do everything over your mobile device. So this kind of access and craving for speed has just become incredibly important throughout the business world. Now, this is just a fun one because I like it, but it says the same thing. <laughs> Millennials would rather have their teeth clean, clean a toilet, wait in line, right, or change a diaper. <laughs> and, right, and this is, I'm um, oh, sorry, I should finish that sentence for you, right? Then this is the, the same thing, then kind of sitting on the phone or interacting, you know, in that way, right? So these are all behaviors that they would rather do. Again, reinforcing this kind of digitization and idea of speed. So here's what it means to you, and I'll put this down for a second, because I think this is, uh, this is kind of the important stuff as we think about now higher education, and especially as I think about world campus and, and kind of where we're going. You know, when, when we think about that, this is how we think about some of the, the process of education, and it's very broad. There's probably many different models, but essentially you move through a research phase, you eventually make your decision and you enroll, you go through an educational experience, you have an outcome, hopefully lifelong learning alumni. What we think about extra outside of that, but just as a business, is this concept of how do we commit to speed, how do we use intelligent online assistance, and how do we create magical moments, right, for people that actually matter. And I'll try to take you through just a little bit of what each of these means if we can spend some time on it. So this first concept of committing to speed, if I've convinced you that that's important, um, a couple of interesting examples of, of how this has kind of played out in real life. So this, this recent political campaign, which I don't mean to comment on, but there's an advertising and marketing component of it that I thought was really important, was Bernie Sanders, right? And when Bernie Sanders was running in this election, I think he became pretty famous for 
$75 million that he raised, and he did that through very small increments. What Bernie Sanders learned through that process was that the majority of the donations that were coming into him were coming in through a mobile environment. They were coming through 3G specifically, not even um, 4, right? So what Bernie did was rather than having a complex process for how people would fill out and um, donate money to him in a pull-down menu and selecting the amounts, they've created one button. <laughs> so basically, you got to the point with Bernie Sanders where you could press a button and give him a small donation, and 30% of his volume ended up coming from that, right? And that was all based on this insight for him of how do I commit to speed? And, and we feel this every day in, in small frictionless ways on the applications and the things that we use from companies. Um, how was used, has everyone used Uber at, at some point or you know, thought of Uber? So Uber takes this to the point where they know that you're, if they, you're the first time you're using Uber, you don't wanna wait, you can take a picture of your credit card now and it'll automatically enter your information. Outside of that being a really cool tool, what that is is Uber saying speed is incredibly important to us. To the, to the point where we're gonna develop this, and then obviously I, I don't even need to share the stories of Amazon, right? Everyone loves Prime and loves Amazon and loves this idea of buying things in one click because it's instantaneous and it's fast for us. So I bring that into the education world, and I begin to think like, what does this mean to education? I think that is just the awesome thing about speaking into a room of faculty, staff, and educators, is you can imagine all sorts of ways to make things one second faster or one step closer to where that person wants to go that I can't even imagine. The simple example in my world that I imagine for an education um, is similar to what Geico did in kind of aligning uh, the DMV and manufacturers and all these people so that you can get an instantaneous quote is just the application process. The application process still takes a very long time. If you have a transfer student in that's looking to, to get an education and is feeling motivated, it can take a while to get transcripts approved. And, you know, I'm at the point where I can get auto insurance and, and it used to be 15 minutes or less, they're gonna have to reduce that because it's much quicker. Or rocket mortgage where I can get a loan for a home in pressing a few buttons. And yet that application process still feels really long. And that is just one small example um, of many that this room can, uh, can pick up. And hopefully that gives you a, an idea of what we mean by speed. Um, this idea of all line assistance. All line assistance is how do we how do we learn about you with every interaction to make your next interaction just a little bit better and a little bit more seamless, right? And one of the great things that I think about in terms of all line assistance is Walgreens. Has anyone used the Walgreens app before or shopped in Walgreens? Is there Walgreens here? There might not even be Walgreens here. <laughs> yeah. All right, Walgreens is a uh, CBS uh, a pharmacy, right, a, a, a drugstore. And Walgreens created an application, as you would expect them to do as a, as a pharmacy, and you can do all the things that you'd expect to do in the Walgreens application. You can fill out a prescription, um, you can get renewals, it'll remind you to go get those, and those are all really useful tools. What Walgreens has also done, though, in this application is they've created an interactive assistant within your shopping experience. So if you walk into Alt Walgreens and you pull on your application, it'll give you, it knows where you are in the aisles in the store, and it'll give you recommendations on, based on the aisles that you're in, right? It'll, it'll begin to inform you in the differences of products. And all of this, again, seems like, oh yeah, a great tool. But if you have the Walgreens app installed and are an active user of it, you tend to spend six times as much with Walgreens as you would if you don't have that. And you start to realize that like some of these things that I often as a consumer consider to just be really cool, useful things for me have very meaningful implications. When I think about online assistance within the education space, you know, what if we lived in a world where through the application process I had an assistant in a digital way that was helping me? And then that digital assistant learned about me. And as it learned about me, it began to inform my education experience. And how much more effective could we be at educating people if we knew that I loved cars? And when you taught me math, you taught it to me in cars, right? And if you were able to do that, would I persist more often and would I be that much better when I actually graduated, right? So those are different applications that I think, you know, again, you would know much more than I. Like these are simple things that I kind of dream up and every time we have these conversations, we learn more. The last thing that we think about is magical moments. And what magical moments are, um, are how do you begin to anticipate and predict my needs and kind of think about the things that I'm gonna 
require in the future, right? And I think this, again, is a, is a perfect Amazon example. You know, Amazon is, is famous for their prediction engine of saying, you've bought this in the past, and we've learned about you, and you'd probably like this, right? And they tailor the experience completely to you in a way where you'd be surprised to learn that about a third of Amazon's um, retail sales come from some form of prediction, right? So they're, they're uh, highly in tune with just how important this is. And I think this is really important to education as well. And I, I, don't, I, I didn't go to Penn State. Like I said, my brother-in-law did, though. So that's an awesome thing. I went to business school up at Cornell. And you know I love the folks at Cornell, because I went to business school there. And I, I still have, uh, it's great. And I, I hear from them without a doubt once a year. <laughs> right? And I know, and everyone in the room knows what it is. It's my email that says it's time to give Cornell a donation. And, uh, and I'm grateful for it, and I often do donate, and uh, like I said, I'm not, I'm not picking on it. And every now and again, I'll get some emails, though, on, hey, we have this seminar at the Cornell Club in New York, and you might enjoy it. But what if I lived in a world where Cornell followed me and understood my context because they had known me through my application process, and then they had learned how to educate me, and then they knew and tapped into the things that I was doing in my career? Cornell would have known that I started at Google three years ago in, in a new job in the education field, and they might have reached out to me and said, hey, here are some courses that might be really interesting to you now that you've switched into this technology company. And in a very simple way, but how do we use these magical moments to begin to build our alumni community, right? And begin to kind of help people and anticipate what they're gonna need in the future, especially if you go back to in this world where 60% of the, the jobs don't exist right now, right? And we need to educate people on different things. This is gonna be, this is a lifelong learning model that is gonna become, in my opinion, incredibly important. Right? And I know to everyone here. So you know, that's, that's one trend in consumer behavior that, that we follow. So, so far, what we've talked about really here is technology and education, trends in consumer behavior. The other thing that we think a lot about is the decision-making process. So you know, how are people searching for an education, and why are they going back to school? Right? Um, and this, to me, is a, a small stat with really big implications. But what we see in terms of search trending is that brand searches for specific universities are declining. And that's been happening for a few quarters now. Program searches and degree searches are increasing, right? And I think as you have, this is, uh, this is where I believe that a lot of this is driven in for two reasons. I think one, the consumer decision journey has fundamentally changed. But I also believe as you have a lot of more, or if you have more non-traditional learners, or what we would consider a traditional learner entering an educational experience, they're looking and investigating this in different ways, right? So this, you know, this is a video, we, we can't play it, um, so sorry to tease you with that, but <laughs> I'll explain to you what was going on in it. Essentially, we went out and we interviewed a whole bunch of people and we said, hey, how do you look for an education? How do you search for an education? Uh, this is Marlon, and what he would say if he was playing the video is, hey, I had a bad day at work. And I pulled out my mobile phone, and I walked out, and I just said, hey, I need time for me to do something different. He's like, and I began to search my, op my, my um, options, and I began to look around. And he eventually enrolled and eventually graduated and eventually wants to go get his PhD. And this is, so this is a perfect example of how this kind of decision journey happens now. It doesn't happen in this linear sense that we've always known it to happen, right? Historically, I picked a few schools. I decided these are the three schools that I know, or four, maybe someone in the family went there. I've always liked that school. I saw the campus at some point. And then we narrow that down through a decision-making path. I think what we're seeing is that that is switching to, I might know a few schools and I could start there, but once I've learned about those schools and what I need in a program and what that program is gonna get me when I graduate and what type of credentials I potentially need, my, my set of schools that I'm gonna decide on actually expands. It doesn't shrink. And I pop around a lot. And it becomes a non-linear path to deciding where I'm gonna go get my education. And I think that simple thing is incredibly important as we think about how we present this information to potential students. And this is the model that, that we think about often, and, and I'll run you through it, and then we'll pause and have some questions. Are we good on time, Larry? Yeah? <clears throat> um, so 
we think about that problem, really, at the end of the day, what we're talking about, right, is the, the moving away of a marketing funnel and moving into a decision journey. And we think about that in, in four different buckets. We think about that in your largest potential audience that you could talk to. We think about it in people that have expressed weak intent, right? Then we think about it in terms of people who have expressed strong intent. And then we think about it in terms of your alumni and your most valuable students. Right? So said another way, largest addressable is anyone that could benefit from an education right? that you'd want to talk to. Weak intent are people that are going into Google and saying, hey, what are my options? I'm, you know, I'm in accounting right now, and I really love to pursue a law degree. And what does that look like? What do law professions look like? Strong intent is a, how much does college cost? right now, right? Like, I want to enroll in Penn State, what will that cost me? Like, that is someone who's going, I'm ready to go do this. And then your students and your grads are really the people that are gonna advocate for you and be your lifelong brand, right? So in thinking about things this way, I think rather than how do I move people through this linear path, you're able to design content at each one of these stages that helps people to make the most informed decision that they can, right? And because we have signals now from search that didn't previously exist in advertising, you can align that content to where they are within this journey. The next decision that you make within thinking about this personalized student journey is where do I want to reach these people? And there's all sorts of different ways that we can do that, right? We can use social media and video. Um, there's, you know, you, you certainly use outdoor and, and even TV and all these things play a role in that even though some of them aren't rep represented uh, on this slide. And you begin to think like, okay, well now that I've aligned this content and I know people, where do I put it? And then ultimately you begin to think about how do I measure that, right? And how do I begin to think about the impact that I've made on people at all these different uh, various stages? And now you're, you're moving into an intent-based framework rather than a linear marketing funnel. And I, I think this is incredibly important as well. And, and again, if you bring, bring us all the way back to the beginning here where we started, which was, you know, we're in the business of, I actually don't have to point that at that, do I? We're in the business of creating future uh, astronauts, scientists, mathematicians. Like, we need to actually begin to talk to people that potentially could have these careers in different ways than we have in the past, right, to make sure that they have role. Then we need to create the educational experience in a way that is consistent with their expectations of how fast the world moves right now, right? And then ultimately, we need to make sure that we have the technology and tools that enables everyone to teach in those ways. Um, and I think when you put all these pieces together, like this is, this is our, my, or at least some of my thinking and overarching point of view on, on how we quickly evolve education into a place that's consistent with uh, frankly, a lot of the things that you've seen, you know, in companies like we shared, like Uber and Walgreens, like these companies are succeeding and people love them for a reason, right? Because they're getting some of, you know, in my opinion, some of these core principles that we talked about. Um, so those are, those are just my, my thoughts for the day that we wanted to, to come here and share. And obviously, we'll open it up to any questions. Larry, I don't know if you want us to, to kind of sit in more of a panel here and... Thank you, Kevin. Uh, appreciate that. Just yeah. say thanks to Kevin for setting the stage. So we're going we're gonna to move our chairs out to the center here and ask Adam to come up as well. But Kevin, let me plant a question that as you talk through this, I wanted to get your reactions to. I want to go back to your daughter, Emily. Yes. Okay. Four? She's four? Emily is yep, four. Emily's four. What, um, what do you think Emily's, if you could project out 10, 12 years, maybe that's even too far, maybe five years, but what do you think she will expect? <laughs> from an institution like Penn State in terms of her, and I'm speaking of her sort of her educational experience. Yeah. You know, you, you've set the bar kind of high. Hey, Dad, you already put me on Mars, right, at four yeah. years old. Shoot, what's that going to mean for us now when she hits our classrooms and all? What are they going to want to see? Wow, yeah. So Emily, that's, an, that's such a great question, and I think about it often because Emily is, is four, you know, and the world is going to look so different by the time she hits Penn State. If I think even back to Gen Z and, and the potential of when they hit Penn State, right? Uh, it's just a, it's a, probably a little bit of a different generation than Emily, but kind of same idea. Gen Z is, Gen Z is interesting because Gen Z is global, right? Like they don't see boundaries the way we see boundaries. Um, Gen Z can have a best friend that is somewhere in Europe, 
And they don't even see that as a potential problem. Like they don't consider that. Like it's, it's just the world that they've grown up in. They play video games at, at a crazy rate, right? And, and they expect that they're gonna learn that way. Um, if you, when you survey Gen Z, I forget the exact numbers because they're, they're not my slides. There's a huge percentage of them that believes they're gonna be employed by themselves. Right? They're, they don't see all the, the limitations and the things. And like maybe a, a good example of this too is just, um, so my other daughter, Alexandra, who's six, she got a rainbow loom. I'm sure no one knows what a rainbow loom is. I didn't know what a rainbow loom is. A couple of people know what a rainbow loom is. So a rainbow loom is like this little board. It's got pegs and you put these uh, little rubber bands around them, right? And it makes bracelets. And there's all different designs of bracelets. So this thing comes in a box and it's got all these rubber bands. And she takes it out, she's like, Daddy, build a, a rubber band bracelet with me. And I'm like, all right, great. Yep, happy to do that, Alexandra. So she puts it on the table, she's got the rubber bands out, and I pull out this brochure like this, and it's like step one through 50 of how, and I'm like reading it and reading it, and a couple minutes go past, and she finally pushes it down, and she's already got the thing halfway done. And I was like, well, what? She's like, don't you work at Google? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, she was like, and she looked down and she voice searched, voice searched for a YouTube video on how to build a, a rubber band bracelet. And, and, and anyway, I don't know if that's a perfect answer to the question, but like the expectation just shifts. Like that's how they learn and they know it. And I'm the guy that works there that's going, I don't even understand that. First of all, <laughs> you know? I just wanted to respond. We're so fortunate to have Emily already enrolled in Penn State. I, I did pick on that when she goes to Penn State. <laughs> yeah. Adam, thoughts from you about what that space might be like for the students? I'll see if I can get this to work. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I, I think it's a, you know, the, the students out there, are, they're going to be very experiential. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of data on, you know, demand for a hybrid uh, opportunity. You know, they, they want to be part of a, a campus experience, but they, they also demand that things are easy and online and, you know, want to move that way. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting moving away from online education and, you know, going to school and just education. Uh, I think that's kind of the, the future of, of that group. Yeah, and I think, and just one more quick thought on that, because this might be here closer than Gen Z, um, yeah. but I think one of the, we've always looked at this world of, there's this traditional education, and then there's this online education, and how do we bring this online education to parity with the traditional education, right, and make sure it's as effective? And I think the, the students quicker than, than Gen Z are saying, I, I want both, and because I want both, they should be better. Like online doesn't need to be at parity. It should give me more because of what it can offer than, than even you know, physical. And, and you, you touched on several uh, technologies uh, that we're very interested in here at Penn State at the moment, artificial intelligence, which right. is built into many of your systems, virtual reality, augmented reality, yep. uh, data analytics, mining, and so forth. Um, and, and Google has an eye on education, um, which we really appreciate, by the yep. way. Um, and I'm just wondering about that confluence of, of, that's why I'm asking about Emily, you know, she's gonna expect to come into a space where, where Mars is in front of her when she's in right. class learning about that. that. That confluence of these technologies, I think we don't know yet how, what that's going to look like in the presentation mode for our, for our students. Yeah. yeah. So let me, let me go to our uh, class here, Jan, um, and Jen has a mic. Since we do have a, a remote audience, we're going to ask you to use the mic. Uh, it was a fascinating talk. Thanks so much. Thank you. I have two questions, if I um, may, <laughs> Larry, have, have two. Um, one is you mentioned astronauts, scientists, and mathematicians. My background is mathematics, so I love math, math. Don't get me wrong here. But how do we make sure we don't leave behind the humanities, the arts, the social sciences. Yeah. So that's one question I'd like to re you to respond to. And the other question is, as much as um, there's a great deal of, um, yeah, you say everyone loves Walgreens app, yeah. and everyone loves Amazon Prime, and everyone loves Google. But everyone is also very frightened of the amount of data that's being collected on us. Right. So we see, a lot of us see it as a real privacy issue. And a lot of people are turning off the, you know, the part of their phone that will 
track you as you move through right. traffic or something. Right. So can you respond to both of those? It's the love-hate relationship with the, yes. with the technology. Yeah. I can, and I'll, I'll try to take them both. So the first one on, I just use math science, and, you know, and, but you're right, and it's, it's kind of a bias that I, I go to that, right? Um, yeah, the whole world does. Yeah, not just me. I don't mean it like that. I'm just saying the, the whole world kind of is right now you know, thinking about those things, and there is importance in kind of the arts and humanities, and, and I believe that deeply. I know a lot of people believe that deeply. Um, I'm not quite sure, you know, the, the exact answer to like how we kind of, uh, how we kind of protect against that or, or mitigate against that. I know one of the things that, that we've done as a company is to create the Google Cultural Institute. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. You can go download the app. And um, basically what we're doing is cataloging the world's arts and, and great things. So everything from Opera House in Paris to um, things in the, the Guggenheim. And we're able to catalog them in a way that's so detailed and deep that we can do different things with them in digital. We can compare paintings. Um, we can allow people to zoom in at a micro level where you can see down to the brush stroke on kind of starry night in a really detailed way. So I think there's ways to combine those things. I don't know if that exactly answers your question on kind of how we protect against that, but like there, it is a, it is a topic that, that people consider, right? Because it's incredibly important to keep those things. Um, Privacy, privacy is a big one, right? Because we take privacy incredibly seriously. And to our founders, really astute observation they have from day one. Like that's not a new adventure for them. Um, they, they really consider what we're doing. I mean, we, we consider it a great responsibility that everyone gives us um, access to these data, to, to their data and their information. Now, we also try to create transparency in how that data is used and your ability to shut it off and your ability to kind of manipulate it where you go. So you have complete control over all the information. I think most of the, the research would suggest that people that see a tangible benefit from you being able to anticipate and help them are very comfortable with, with sharing information. And, and of course, without having the exact numbers in front of me, like I, I won't quote them, but it, I, that increases as the world gets kind of younger, right? Um, and, and that's kind of what we see. But the only thing I would say to it is that like, there is safeguards in place and the company has been founded on principles of kind of making sure that one, it's protected and two, transparency is provided. Just to go back for a real quick second, and we're going to go to Kyle here on that humanities question, too. I think it's part of our responsibility as the community to think about how do we tap into those resources in an art history class or in an English class, because that volume of available content now has become so rich, and that yeah. I think it's really exciting uh, opportunity. I know Kyle's going to present a question from our online audience. Yes, we actually have five queued up, but I'll, Ooh, I'm going go to combine ahead. the first two. Do. Uh, but I, I don't have to be, they don't have to be all in a row, I, I understand <laughs> that. So Mark Simpson uh, and Mary Goza Cohen both had questions about VR. Uh, Mark's was more general, like what does Google see as the future for VR in education? And Mary was looking for whether you've seen, she's really into uh, medical education. And have you seen VR as playing important roles in medical education? Yeah, I mean, definitely the, back to the arts question, um, you know, the, the applications that Kevin mentioned are, uh, are definitely uh, available in a VR environment. And there's a lot of things that you can do with those to, to bring, you know, new experiences and new ways of looking at, you know, art pieces and uh, places in the world and, you know, looking at uh, anatomy and, uh, you know, medical. So I think those are definitely going to be, you know, parts of it and, and within the community just kind of leveraging the, the early days of VR and getting there quick. Um, you know, Google started the, you know, kind of started the engine and has the devices, but I think content is going to be key as you move forward and, and you know, the education community can, can really push it forward. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think the future of VR is huge. Right, I mean, look at how quickly, like the whole Pokemon Go story is, is interesting and that's more augmented than yep. VR, but like, that, that, that just took off. There's, there's also an interesting story just about the, like the, I guess the, the, the reality of, of VR, you know, the, the actual um, kind of effect it has. The, uh, the, when they were testing the, the new Daydream software, uh, they had uh, just a simple program where people climbed to the top of a ladder 
Um, first, they started at you know, 10 feet and looked down. Then they went up 20 feet, looked down. And they could actually measure the person's heart rate. And as they got to you know, 150 feet, they were racing uh, yeah. because they, the, the, you know, the experience was so real. So this is the, the type of experience that you can provide with just a very simple ladder program. Think about you know, what you can do with uh, you know, a really cool art uh, or, or medical kind of learning. Yeah, I think and I think we're just kind of at the small. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like there's just so much more. It's only going to get better, faster, more efficiently. It's not going to go the other way, right? So I think like, we're, we're going to evolve from these kind of devices we have now. And then to the medical point, there, I, there's a great article that I'll find and I can follow up that uh, basically it was used um, in a medical environment to kind of see part of a surgery that wasn't previously able to be viewed. And I'm, I won't do it justice because I don't have all the details, but I will find the article and I'll ship it over because it's, yeah. it's interesting. Kyle, before we go to the second one, I just a quick follow-up question. Does, does Google have a, um, a program, and I, I'm sorry I don't know this, but does Google have a program where you would work with uh, a researcher at a, you know, and, and do joint research projects to use Google Platforms technologies for educational applications? I don't know that we have a, an exact one that is, uh, but there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of opportunities for, um, you know, students, PhDs to come over and do kind of interim projects. Um, there's a, there's, there is a program that I know of, and it's, the name is missing me right now, but um, where you know, people come in and they'll, they'll be supported by grants from Google and work in tandem with, uh, with some of the engineers at, at, uh, at the organization. Yeah, I don't know of anything completely defined, but there's weight. Like, yeah, yeah, there's ways to do it. It's not a thing that is outside of what we would do. Okay, good. We'll be coming back to you on that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. Kyle, did you want to get a second one in? And then, oh, go ahead, Jen. Robert? Um, yeah, uh, I was just thinking about the, the, some of the discussion we've had about arts and humanities. As an arts and humanities person who does IT, um, the slide that you showed that the top things that employers are looking for, we don't do humanities to curate old things or read old books. We do them in order to build critical thinking skills, in order to teach communications in order to build teamwork, in order to problem solve. All of those are byproducts of a liberal, a liberal arts education. Sure. So to look at it as the things we study rather than why people study those things, I think is how you need to turn the question around. Yeah, I think it's, it's very yeah. interesting as well to kind of think of how employers are looking at uh, you know, hiring and, uh, and credentials in that way, you know, if they are looking for those things and they look on a resume and say, you know, oh, okay, I studied history, um, you know, are they kind of thinking about those type of things instead of uh, yeah, I, thinking absolutely. where's the math degree, you know, th those type of things. I think what that slide says is exactly that, and it's just, it's saying that we're, we're moving towards general cognitive. Right, and you're starting to, that's starting to play an incredibly important role, especially in a world where, I keep saying it, but it's, it's the stat that maybe I get obsessed with, but 60% of the people are gonna be employed in jobs that don't even exist. Like they're just ones, they're careers that we haven't think about, like 3D printing, and those are ones that we can think about, right? And, and what are the ones that we can't, that we're, and we're gonna need people to be able to adapt to be able to go do those things. It's an interesting, really interesting point because it suggests, and the first thought I had when you put that slide up was, we don't need to be focusing as much as, on the content as we used to when a lot of us went through, right? Because the content is readily accessible. But to your point, Robert, we need to be helping students develop those skill sets of the critical thinking and analysis and so forth. Uh, r really exciting stuff using, you know, leveraging some of the technologies and the platform that, that you gentlemen have been talking about. So. I appreciate that. Kyle, we're gonna to go to you for a, a second question. Alicia Swaggerty from, uh, I was gonna say from Des Moines, Iowa, but I won't do she's that. Now in, she's now I in Florida, I happen okay. to know. From uh, Florida asks, I'm sort of paraphrasing your question here. It, uh, does it seem conceivable that higher ed might not just be an association with one institution, but an opportunity for learners to work with a collection of universities to really personalize their journey uh, with the best options, experiences, et cetera? Yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're, you're starting to see a little bit of that, right? Mm. So I, don't, I, I think it's conceivable just because like, you're already seeing some of that in, in MOOCs and many of the other things that are beginning to happen out there and, and personalization. And, and it's also Gen Z and their kind of mentality is like, I'm just gonna go find ways to educate myself. Like the, the Rainbow Loom story is a fun one, but it's also, I don't, like I can go figure it out now because, and like you see this happen all the time. Like I, I recently have relearned how to play golf. Like so I used to play, I have three kids, six through one, so you can imagine why I had a good about six year break. <laughs> <laughs> but like I've started again and I knew how to play a little bit not great and it, my learning curve is I don't go to an instructor I watch YouTube videos and then I go practice and I really do use it that way and in a simple way like there's gonna they, they have access and believe that they can go train themselves in some ways so yeah that's but they also important point to make they also I, I forget the number but it's over 80% deeply believe that a degree is important to them mm. So they aren't looking at it and just going, I don't need a degree because I can teach myself. They're going, I get that a degree is valuable. I just believe that I can get it in a, in a non-traditional way. And they also, a huge percentage of them, absolutely believe it should be customized to them. Jen. Mm. Oh, wow. You can end up graduating, you get a bachelor's degree that... <laughs> yeah, some, sorry. So summarizing, <laughs> Korea has a, a, a thing, the Korean Academic Credit Bank or something like that, where you can take courses at different universities and file those uh, courses with the university. And at some point, the, the government, I, I believe, can, instant, can issue a bachelor's degree. So there may be things like that that come in our future. Yeah, that's interesting. Also, just for a, a different bent on the partnership, for the machine learning people in the crowd, it's it's interesting from a large set of data perspective. You know, if you've got more universities working together, sharing uh, data on outcomes and how people learn, uh, you've got bigger data sets and faster, you know, learning models. I'm going to go to Renee only because she's had her hand up most of the time, and then we'll come back to Nikki. Is that okay? Craig. Oh, Craig. Okay. Sorry, Craig. We're putting you down. You're, you're third. You're third in line. So you mentioned di the use of digital assistants, and Penn State just recently switched to Lion Path, which I'll, so I'll say about that, and um, I think is also using Starfish. Those are some tools that we have available to us among many, but what do you think are the key things that will be necessary for student recruitment, retention, and the things that they need through their educational journey? Looking at the whole life cycle yeah. of that experience. Yeah, I. Um, so it's a great question. So from start to finish, like that, I'm thinking about it. I have an outcome, right? Um, I think it's a, it's a great question, and I, I don't know that anyone's quite solved it or answered it yet. You know, I, I think the universities that do begin to think about that though, and just kind of take that one step. Like, how do you just make it quicker? How do you make it more useful? How do you make it more applicable through every one of your interactions? And if everyone thinks that way, like eventually you're gonna evolve into this incredibly useful tool that could go on and, and kind of do great things. So I think on the front end of it, there's people wanna be more informed and they want more research and they wanna make their decision based on the content and experiences that you're giving them, right? And I think that's how you originally are gonna engage. I think through the kind of for lack of a better term, I'll call it a courtship process, right? Of like, I'm investigating you and I'm doing all these things. Like there's, if you think about your school, so right now I'm sure most of your enrollment people would say if someone comes and visits our campus, they fall in love and they're a student, right? And, and a lot of schools say that for themselves and rightfully so, because you have these great experiences. But there's only so many people that can go do that. And maybe you can begin to use a digital assistant by saying, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna download this, this application and you can virtually visit us. And then if you can take the next step and come visit us. And then we'll stay in touch with you through this kind of application and learn about you. Here's your deadlines, here's your, you know what I mean? And through that process, you're slowly, gra you're slowly learning more about who that person is. So now they've made the decision and said, all right, I'm gonna go with you. That information shouldn't get lost, it should be connected into the profile that you've already started of that student. And then you should say, here's how I tailor my education. Hey, have you considered this? These are courses that we've 
think might be appropriate for you, you know, so on and so forth, will teach you in different ways. You know, I mean, we think you might enjoy this type of experience, even matching professors, who knows, whatever, whatever it might be. And then after, that stays with them too, and there's a lifelong learning journey, and they have a profile where they can begin to go back and view their history of the different kind of skills that they've acquired, right? And that helps to prepare them for the workforce and how they're gonna present themselves. And, and anyway, that's kind of a pretty rudimentary like drawing of how that would play throughout, but I think someone needs to design that. I don't know that that is a, there's a stock, you know, someone invented it and you guys plug it in. But I think it would be a cool thing to design. So almost be like an, <laughs> an educational, uh, uh, cursi, uh, what's the word I want to say, concierge, going to take you through your experience. Yep. And maybe part of that is to say Penn State might not have exactly what you need, but look, Cornell has a program, and you begin, back to Kyle's point, you begin to build and help that learner through their lifetime, putting together the pieces and the parts of, their, of what meets their career goals. Yeah, and it'll only evolve as technology evolves and as machine learning and all these things evolve, it'll only become smarter and better. And if you think about, if you think about Google now and with the Google Assistant, right, and you think about Google Home and all these different ways that Google's connected into your life, you know, all of that begins to make Google more useful for you, right, and the things that you can communicate and use it for. And it becomes integrated into just how you interact with your, your day to make it better, quicker, more useful, easier, in a way where you don't sit there and think about it all the time. Like, I don't think you sit around and consider how Google is just so important to you, but like, it, in, in different ways, it helps you throughout everything you do. Good point. Nikki, do you have the mic or Craig? Right oh, here. oh, over here, Annie. Okay. You had a line. Is it? Uh, that's okay. Well, you've got the mic. Go, all right, Annie. All right, I have the mic. Um, we've talked about different ways of immersing the student into the educational experience. Um, I'm wondering what you could tell us about things you've heard about or seen or maybe are working on. Um, you know, we've got uh, today all this, this big camera set up and a soundboard and whatever so that we can help our, our remote learners or you know participants join um, i'm just so hopeful for a day when it's easier than that yeah. um, and especially for things not only to bring you know it, more and more people don't want to have to cross campus let right. alone um you know it, are across the country or they have a disability uh, there's some other reason they want to rem uh, participate remotely and we see it in things like poster sessions um, we we got excited about the technology, the little robot, you know, with the the screen. But that's yeah. one person, mm -hmm. you know. You 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 know, you'd have to have twenty of those, or fifty of those, or a hundred to be able to let all the remote people have that experience. When you talked about the shared uh, Google Cardboard, uh -huh. I'm, I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if instead of being on the surface of Mars together, right. we were at a poster, a live poster session together, or you know, so we could each inexpensively and easily participate. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I mean, look, I could daydream all day about stuff like that. So I think it's great because like you can say, like, oh, here's this cool technology and there's potential things that we could do with it and. Um, and that would be, th those are all interesting examples. I think for me, you know, the, the, the simple applicable right now are just utilizing things that exist like Hangouts and, you know what I mean? What are the different ways that you can use Hangouts to just put everyone in a virtual environment? And, and, and frankly, like when you're in, in a Hangout, sometimes it's even a different experience than, the, than a classroom because you can really dial into each person individually, right? And their expressions and their engagement, and you can kind of, you know, so sometimes like it would be interesting just to have sessions like right now over Hangout and consider all those things. Um, and then eventually evolving into a virtual environment would be, would be really cool, especially as you think about your distance learners. And then, and then you start to think about, how, well, how do you integrate it in in ways that makes it not as good again, but better? Right, so if, even if you're in an environment in the classroom but you have cardboard, it's like, okay, like we're studying this very kind of minuscule thing that we wouldn't ever be able to all look at right now. Like, right, like an example off the top of my head, and I'm just making this up kind of on the spot here, but like if I was sitting in a classroom and I had a microscope to go incredibly deep into something, but that was already kind of laid out for me in a virtual environment, Rather than everyone kind of using this microscope, you can go, all right, now we can look at it and, and look at the different angles of it in ways that we've never been able to, to kind of think about before as we're kind of educating people. And you find these ways to kind of 
pull it out. My sister is a uh, art teacher, and she uh, teaches in grade school. And she used, I, I introduced her to cardboard, and she loves it. And she uses it all the time now for them to explore different artwork and different kind of uh, statues and, and things like that from all sorts of different angles that the kids couldn't. And she always tells me that how amazed she is at the difference between them being either talked at, looking at something flat, and physically experiencing something in that way, and like the reaction that they have. So I don't know, if that doesn't get to like your question of like what's the kind of distant future, but I think just like even taking some of that stuff that you can do right now and thinking about the cool imaginative ways that you can use it is cool, is, is interesting. And Annie, I gotta tell you, I took that as a direct challenge. <laughs> no, I did, I did. I'm thinking like, what can we be doing better about these kind of events that creates a more engaged and rich? I, I love the idea, thank you, good. Uh, Nikki, we're gonna go to you. Yes, um, I know we've touched on it a little bit, especially with the, uh, the slide of the top skills that people want and, and what students are searching for today. The idea that we're not going to be in the same career for life or that students today are preparing for a career they don't have. So as I'm looking at all of that information, I wonder if we're going to get a to a point when Generation Z becomes learners that uh, maybe it's not even about searching for a program and it's about searching for what they wanna learn about topics and are we going to get to a place where somebody might want a lifelong learner subscription to higher ed to be able to access courses as their careers change? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question and I love all the questions, really good. So one of my, uh, one of my colleagues at Google, this guy I love, his name is uh, Jamie Cassup. Some of you may know him or have heard of him. And Jamie's awesome. And he thinks a lot about Gen Z and he's got a great story. And if you haven't heard from him, he's got TED Talks. He spoke here at Penn yes, State before. Yeah. Last, year. Um, last year, yeah. So, so Jamie's awesome and you should check him out. But one of the things that Jamie always says kind of to this point that I think is really relevant is that he doesn't ask kids anymore or potential students what they want to be when they grow up. He asks them what problem they want to solve. Mm -hmm. And, and it's such a, like, I, I think about that sometimes because, like, Jamie's really smart and he says things in a way that makes me want to think about him. <laughs> but also because I, I think we're moving into a place where it's not like, I want to be this when I grow up. It's like, I see this problem and I need to solve it. And now I need to imagine the different skills, resources, tools from everywhere that I need to acquire to be able to go solve that problem. And we've engaged people in like a little bit of a different way than the historical sense of just saying like, hey, you're, you're building towards this thing you're going to be. Yeah, I think that you, you almost see it uh, emerging now with, you know, micro degrees, certificates, these type of things that are being offered. Nano degrees are coming. You know, it's everything is uh, piecemeal learning about a specific problem. And it's, uh, it's emerging now, I think, in, in learners um, and it's in everybody's mindset. Boy, it's a little bit of a challenge for higher ed to shift some things around to adjust to that. Uh, let's go back to Craig. Um, as business people, you're always looking for opportunities. And so sort of a contrarian question about higher ed's opportunity and contrasting speed with slow. And I agree, we should have a concierge service so a student has, doesn't, have to, doesn't have to go to the bursar or the admissions office or registrar. It should be elegant. But is there a true opportunity for higher education to focus on being slow? If I give an example, a student I know who's majoring in petroleum engineering goes to North Africa and participates in helping making small greenhouses for poor villages and comes back and now is majoring in policy studies and wants to, you know, he was changed by the immersive, slow experience of being reflective. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that, you know, as you and keep going down this path is what if something popped up and said, you love this, you're going to hate this. You know, I'm thinking like when I travel, this is public broadcasting space, I listen to Fox Radio out in the country, right. hear what people think. You know, students, if all they get is this, this, and this, yeah. it's narrow and narrow, they're never exposed to something completely different. Are there opportunities for, for universities to look at speed of service, but slowness of learning and reflecting, reflection, and also diversity? Is You think, think this, you'll love this, but you might hate this, but you might want to listen to it just to open your mind. Yeah, so that's a really important question, right? And I, and I agree um, with everything that you're saying. I think there's a balance between consumer expectations and staying consistent and relevant with what people expect, but then also being reliant. And this is why 
like devices and technology don't make engaged students and there's an importance of kind of faculty and people to begin to think about like well, what are these decisions that we're making and how do we understand and control the areas where this should be seamless for me and then this area where we really need to kind of dig deep and go you, you have to think about this one right and these are the important topics for you to pull out and I, I don't know if I have a great answer as much as to say that like I recognize the point and I think I, I think that we need to be reliant on, on everyone to kind of to, to think about those things, right? And that's why I would come to a university. But there's certain things that the speed and, and those kind of um, implications for me are more about taking the, taking the unnecessary stuff out of the way. Like, because if you, all right, so what we said before, everyone's used Uber. Like how, many, how many people have picked up their phone and looked at the Uber and it said four to five minutes and you were like, oh, <laughs> like four to five minutes. Like you used to call and wait like, you know, forever for the cab to get there and you didn't even know when it was coming. And, and that is something where you've kind of, they've, they've taken this thing and they've changed it, right? And now like that's just my expectation. Like that needs to happen. Otherwise I am completely frustrated by, by your experience. So I do think that there's, we need to figure out the balance between those things where you're taking stuff out of the way but then engaging in a really deep way to open up people's minds. Um, and yeah, I think that's important. I don't know, again, if that it completely addresses well, it as I think much it, as like I see it. Yeah. It's also a very, a, a very general discussion that has kind of popped up recently in the, in the tech world is, you know, are we creating too many bubbles with you know, predictive algorithms and, and things like that and shielding people from stuff that they, you know, we're saying they, are, they hate but you know, we're not even allowing them to be exposed to it. So I think that's, that's a, a general, you know, technological uh, debate right now is like, where is the balance, right, between feeding people what they, what we predict they will like versus, you know, exposing them to things that they don't, they wouldn't normally see. You know, there's a, um, what's occurring to me is that through this discussion is the importance of technology not taking away our ability to think. Right. right now, I've got these algorithms and this data that is doing the thinking for me. We don't, we really don't want that. We want it to enhance our ability to think deeper. Yeah. Right about these kind of relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, think Adam, deeper and differently. Right. I think uh, Adam's got the mic. Yeah. So we share a room right now with a number of powerful people who have influence over higher ed, but I'm sure I'm not alone in my interest in K-12 as well along with your presentation, had a number of examples that fit very well with K-12. I'm curious on your experience with the company, obviously, that you work for, uh, any anecdotes you have that suggest the leader or follower between higher ed technology advancement offerings for students, K-12 technology advancements, who needs to lead that? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so, and uh, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of kind of thought thinking on K-12, but then also this idea of kind of non-traditional learners and consumer behaviors that exist right now. So the question is like what companies are out there and kind of just doing great things in this space, right? And continuing to evolve. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff just in its infancy. So like a broad category wise, right? Like, I mean, I think you have uh, MOOCs and you have your OPMs and you have all those players that are beginning to to kind of think about how they, they solve those problems. And I, I don't have anything kind of ed tech that's smaller than that where I'm going, but I, I think what you're also seeing is some companies too that are beginning to tap into this gaming mentality and kind of gamification and figuring out how to use that to learn and, and do things. And there are companies doing great things. I don't know that there's anyone that's kind of broken out, right? And is like all of a sudden figured out the model because of all the reasons that we're discussing. Like it's a naughty problem. It's not a, it's not a simple problem. Like education is this incredibly important thing that we've done forever. And like, I, I think it's hard to kind of sum it up and. There's a lot of, there's a lot of experimentation out there. And yeah. I think the, the burst from Khan Academy early days uh, was very, everybody was very hopeful that that was like the silver bullet, but it proved that it's, it's a lot harder than that. Uh, yeah. And you know, people are working on different versions of that type of model and uh, I think it's like you said very early days it'll be here but yeah it's a complex uh, scenario we're trying to to it's a complex set of problems we're trying to correct yeah. um, I'm gonna uh, just respect our online learners which is why I asked Kyle to give us uh, online learners they are online learners but our online audience would you give us one more question so we have Kyle? one important question that probably has a relatively brief answer uh, coming from Carmen Strand that was forwarded 
moved forward by two other online participants. So let's move to the top. She says, I understand one of our roadblocks at PSU in using Google services is the international, non-US location of servers and student privacy concerns. I also understand that Google may have identified a solution for the military. Can you address this and whether a solution has been identified? I can't. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we got, Great I question, wanna, short I, answer. I, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I just said, I, and I wouldn't want to, yeah, I, I don't know. No speculation. Okay. No speculation. <laughs> yeah. See their lawyers. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen. Oh, we got one more question, Jen says. Let's get one more. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, one of your slides said uh, creativity is something that you want, it's something we want in hires. Uh, a bunch of us have been brainstorming for years at Penn State with some success, but a lot of frustration because how are you going to measure whether someone has picked up a package of creative skills? Everybody's in favor of it. Everybody believes probably at Penn State that they're teaching some aspects of it. But we don't measure it in right. a serious way. And you say you want to come back to us and work on you know, some research projects. That might be one where pooling some of the ways that you guys are thinking in visionary ways and thinking about virtual reality. If you've never been in a situation before that you encounter in virtual reality, that's a well thought out kind of virtual reality, sure. then maybe something along those lines could be very powerful. It's thinking in new ways, in new situations, in flexible ways that's at the heart of creativity. Would you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we, I, I think we just take that as a, as a great challenge. Like, I, mean, I think that's something that we, we should come back with and think about is like, how do we do that? Because as a company, we think a lot about creative, creativity. We create creative environments. Like everything, that, a lot of the things that we do are by design. Right, most almost everything we do is by design. Like if you step foot in our offices and you experience them, I, and I did this too with my kids. Like I said, I talk about my kids a lot. Like I really gotta. But I brought them into the office, and I've been working there for three years. So I bring them in the office, and they walk through our lobby, and there's like one of those little wire toys where you.